nation. Under God. Under God. God. Indivisible. Indivisible. With liberty, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. all. Clerk, take the roll. Mayor O'Connor. Here. Marset. Here. Alms. Here. Dazeel. Here. Weber. Here. Atkins Hoggett. Here. And Hall. Here. All right, first thing that we have tonight is uh, a presentation by Gina Anderson uh, regarding Burton Field. Gina, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you here. Um, thanks for letting me come tonight. I admit I'm nervous. I'm normally not somebody who comes and complains. I'm always tries to be somebody who wants to be part of the solution and figure out ways to um, be, be help if there's an issue. So um, I'm just here because I've been working on this for four years and I'm just a totally exasperated. I don't know what else to do. So I'm coming to you and asking for your help. Okay. Um, so this was the state of the rink on January 9th, 2021. You can see there's barely a half inch of ice. It's totally non-skatable, although we'd had several weeks of freezing temperatures. And what's consistently is happening is Hudson opens our rinks three to four weeks after most rinks are in the, in the area. And I know because I will be at North Hudson or I'll be in Bayport or, or River Falls and talking with people and everybody's just frustrated about why aren't the Hudson rinks open yet? So this is, I live in the neighborhood. I'm on their daily basis, check on them for any updates. Um, so when they actually opened this year was January 26th. And so, you know, several again, we'd had three, four weeks of freezing temperatures. There really wasn't, we couldn't blame it on weather this year. Um, but then once they are open, there's no regular flooding or daily maintenance of the rinks. It's kind of hit or miss about, will they get cleared? Will they be reflooded? Are they actually skatable or not? So. Families, you'll see them driving past, looking, can we do it, can we skate, is it safe, is it not safe? It's really not consistent about is it done when it can be done. And my third point I would bring up is just the lack of supplies to make it safe and enjoyable experience. There is no mats to get from the warming house out to, or if there are mats, they're shoved in the corner of the warming house, not actually put outside. This year there's no rinks, or pardon me, there's no mats. Um, there's no benches outside of the hockey rink, so kids are sitting in, on the ground or they're sitting on piles of snow to try to put their skates on. I, and I do appreciate the fact that there were some bleachers put over by the skating rink, but for the hockey rinks, the kids are literally sitting on the frozen ground to try to put their skates on. And if anybody skated, you know how miserable that can be. Um, and the families, they really, really want this. We, we want to skate. We, it's like one of the last things that you can do together as a family outside. And this was a picture of December 30th. There was one corner of the rink that had been flooded and the family was so desperate that they brought their own shovels and, and shoveled off a little 10 by 10 piece of ice to try to get this family to, to skate. Um, again, you can see the, the, the weather was okay. The temperatures, it was, it was able to be flooded and, and, maintain, and, and up and running, but it just wasn't. It wasn't gonna open for another three weeks yet. And then this is an example of once it is flooded, it's not maintained. This is February 3rd and it took, it sat like that for four days and it wasn't because it snowed again and it wasn't because of the weather, it just because it really wasn't a priority to go out in a flood and get the rinks in a safe and skatable condition. So you can see kids are kind of skating, but really only half the rink was usable. So here's what I'm seeing happening because I've been watching this for four years trying to figure out. And again, I have talked with city council members. I've talked with two parks department directors. I've talked with the city administrator. I've said, what can we do to help? My husband and I have flooded the rinks. We've tried to clear them with our tractors, with our shovels. But what, where the breakdown is happening, that is in December when the rinks, you should really build up that thick base of ice, it's not happening. So then what happens is in January, you get a little bit warmer temperature, it starts to melt, it's not, and so then it's just the cycle, it just keeps repeating, it's just not, we just don't have a good base to begin with in December as soon as it can happen because you need to flood on a, every time the weather's gonna cooperate to start to build up the ice. And then, as I said, once the snow, once the season is open, it's just they're just not being maintained in the way that we would hope in order for it to be skatable for kids and families. I've talked with everybody trying to figure out what the breakdown has happened. And this is what I've been told. First is that parks personnel have to plow, plow the streets. Great. And I'm not asking people to not plow streets. I'm not asking people to make that a priority. But the reality is 
you can plow streets and keep a rank open at the same time. Like, I get it, the parks said that the streets are a priority. Um, sometimes we've been given, well, next week it's gonna get warm, so no use flooding now. Well, that's because the, the warming weather's a problem because we haven't built a thick layer of ice to begin with. There seems to be a battle over which budget should fund the water expense, and so it's kind of like, well, if we can't decide this, then we're not really gonna flood them the way we want to. So I don't know what that's about, but that's one reason I've been told. And then that the last one, that the grounds need to be better leveled. And I agree that they were in the best of shape, but I was so hopeful this summer when I saw that there was some work done, it looked like some drainage and it had been re-leveled. So I was so excited, like maybe this year's really gonna be different. And then again, they didn't open until January 26. So if I had to boil it down to what, in talking with lots of families, and I can tell you it's not just me, it's not just a, a group in our neighborhood, it's families that I'm talking, that, that if you see on next door, you see on the Facebook page, everybody's saying, why can't we figure this out? We just wanna have a skating rink. Um, everybody would like for it to be open in December for when kids are on Christmas vacation, and granted, weather's not always gonna permit that, but even if it's just half the time, families are looking for that. Um, really this basic daily maintenance to keep them skatable. And I will tell you, my son went skating on the hockey rink be probably before it was really skatable and he got hurt. He, he hit a patch of ice and went flying and he got hurt. And I had to take and keep him home from school for two days because I was worried about a concussion. And for me, that was sort of the final straw of we have to do something about this. Um, the warming house, I'm so appreciative of the fact that, you know, there was the budget and the warming houses were done a couple years, but I don't even think they were open once last year. And so I get it this year, I applaud your decision to not open them because of COVID, but please keep the warming houses open. If we're gonna have them, it just feels like, it's just so disappointing to go skating and then, the, and then it's not open. And I would just submit that if it's a, if it's a personnel expense, that they really don't have to be staffed. I mean, it's just kids in there changing their skates. There's nothing, I, I really don't, there's other communities, they don't have to have this, the warming houses staffed every time, every time it's open. And then just some basic supplies. If there were shovels and brooms out there, guess what? The families and kids, they would brush the snow off. They would help with the rink maintenance, but there's no supplies out at all. There's, you know, it'd be great to have some of the little skater chairs for kids that are learning how to skate because this is the rink where families wanna take their kids and teach them how to skate. And it's, you know, we're all looking for ways to keep kids outside, get them off their screens, get them active. Skating rinks are a big part of it when you live in a cold temperature like we do. And finally, there was been talk, I've heard, I saw it in the, in the strategic plan about permanent rinks and liners and all of that. And, and I've been hearing about this for over four years since Tom Zuli was director and every year I, I'm hoping and then it just doesn't happen. So um, that would have solved, I think, a lot of the problems with the drainage and with the maintenance and with just with the flooding. And so I would really encourage the council to consider that. And again, I don't want to just be somebody who comes in and complains. We really want to be part of the solution. Um, there are volunteers who will help flood the rink and there's groups of neighborhoods dads who say i will go out and i will do it at night but there needs to be somebody who's organizing it and i tried to do it last year and it just fell apart um i've also talked to the coach of the hudson havoc those of you who know is our junior hockey league team he's saying great i'll send my players out they'll teach kids how to skate or they can help flood we want to get them involved they're looking for ways to do community service so there's ways we can be creative about getting the community involved and finally, I had made the offer two years ago because in my professional life, I do a lot of event planning. I do plan major festivals. I said, you know, I would help the city plan a river hockey rink as part of the Hudson Hot Air Fair. I think there's a great potential to draw a lot of people. It'd be exciting. It adds a lot of a whole new dimension to the hot air fair. But I need to see that the city's willing to at least kind of maintain the two rinks that we have and, and make skating a priority. So um, my final words, um, it might be tempting to think, well, why do we need rinks? Because we've got the hockey rinks up at the top of the hill. Those are open for one hour once a week, 6 to 7 p.m. That's it. So if you've got younger kids and you have to pay for it, it's just not an option. If you, it's not an option. So if you're not, if you're not enrolled in hockey and you're able to pay three, dollars $4,000 a year in order to enroll your kid in hockey, your kid's not going to learn how to skate here. As I said, please help, especially this winter. We're all so desperate to get our kids outside, active. Skating rinks are really a big part of that. And it's one of the few things that all generations can participate in. You know, we have wonderful parks and playgrounds here, but guess what? Playgrounds after kids are about eight or nine years old, they don't really don't play on playgrounds anymore. 
but skating is something that you can do even when you're no longer on the team and or my husband who's a Hudson has been right who used to play in hockey he looks forward to trying to go out there and skate on that rink every year with some of his old friends so I would just say I think it could be it can be such a vibrant part of our community we have a great skating tradition we can build on it even more I would just please ask if you haven't been out there I mean this was my son two years ago wanted to go skate and the snow was up to his knees on the hockey rink so um, that's just all I have to say and I really hope that you will just please just don't assume that it's all okay there because it's not all right okay, okay thank, thank you. you very much Gina thank appreciate you. it uh -huh. All right, uh, moving into public hearings. Uh, public hearing regarding final special assessments for 2020 Mill and Overlay Project, the Industrial Street and Stage Line Road. This is uh, open hearing, or public hearing rather, so if you have a comment, this is your opportunity to make a comment regarding this particular subject. Uh, if you are on Zoom, please un unmute yourself and just chime in because we can't see Aaron, you got something to say? You're muted. <laughs> Aaron? Nothing? All right, so again, if you're, uh, if you are on Zoom, shaking his head. Uh, just, just chime in and uh, don't wait. We, I can't see you, so I can't see if you're raising your hand or not. Uh, all right, so is there anyone that would like to make a comment? Anyone that would like to make a comment? Anyone that would like to make a comment? A move to close the public hearing. Second. second. Got a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved, public hearing is closed. Discussion of possible action regarding adoption of the final special assessments resolution number 4-21 for 2020 mill and overlay project industrial street and stage line road. I think you want Dean on this one? I don't know who's up. Dean, Dean, Dean is this you? You're muted. Uh, Brian? What's it say? What's it say, Aaron? <laughs> Brian, are you are you muting people? He's nodding his head. I'm here. My apologies. Uh, I, hey, I'm unmuted. Yay. Uh, <laughs> Brian, can you unmute, unmute Dean, please? Yes. You know what? Thank Just you. one second. One second. I want to go back. I know that we closed the public hearing, but was there anybody out there that was trying to get in that pub public hearing but didn't because we were muted? And that's what I was trying to say, Mayor. I apologize for that. I couldn't get off on mute. I couldn't um, read your lips, Aaron. <laughs> I was trying. Um, so yeah, just as a reminder, um, you can't voluntarily unmute yourself. So if you'd like to make a comment, push the reactions button and then raise hand. Um, and then we are watching that. And if we see anybody, we will unmute you. Okay. Was there anybody that wanted to be, uh, wanted to comment in the public hearing that didn't have a chance? Anything? No. Nope. I'm not in any hands. I don't see any. All right, so we'll move on. Um, Dean, you're up. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Uh, so the resolution tonight is just to adopt the final special assessment amounts for the 2020 Mill and Overlay Project on Industrial Street and Stage Line Road. Um, so about a year ago, uh, we adopted preliminary assessments for this project and uh over time as the bids came in and, and the work was actually done uh the assessment amounts were tweaked uh, up or down depending on on the nature of the improvements on each property's frontage uh so the the resolution is just to adopt the final assessment amounts uh to get the process rolling for collecting those assessments any questions anybody I move to suspend the rules. Second. Motion and second to suspend the rules. Roll call. Marset? Yes. Alms? Yes. Dezio? Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? 
Yes. Hall. Yes. Motions approved. Rules are suspended. Move to adopt resolution 4 21. Second. Motion is second to approve. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Comments and suggestions from citizens present. Comments are limited to five minutes. They must address items not listed on the agenda, are limited to issues that have an impact on the city of Hudson, and that the Common Council may address at a future meeting and must not include endorsements of any candidates or other electioneering. An exception to the five minutes, five minute limits may be made at the discretion of the mayor. As presiding officer, the mayor may allow public comment on agenda items during discussion by the Common Council following a motion and a second being made on said, said agenda item. The mayor may place time limits on individual comments as he or she deems necessary. All right, so this is your opportunity to comment on things that you uh, would like to discuss that affect the uh, governance of the city of Hudson. Same thing here, please unmute yourselves. Uh, I guess you have to uh, uh, somehow indicate that, uh, what, what is it, Aaron? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so it's on the, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a button that says reactions. Click on that and click raise your hand. And we're watching and we'll see if anybody raises their hand. All right, having said that, uh, is there anyone that would like to make a comment? Any comments? Any comments? Any comments? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, consent agenda. Approve the meeting minutes from February 1st, 2021 regular council meeting. Approve the claims in the amount of $4,000 or $421,229.38. Approve the operator's license listed on the list sheet. Place on file the January 12th, 2021 Public Utility Commission meeting minutes. Approve the reappointment of Susie Quorum to the Public Utilities Commission with the term ending September 30th, 2023. Approve the purchase of body and squad cameras for the police department. Approve the placement of a temporary placement of sled structure holder at Vine Street Sledding Hill. Okay, we have a motion. Move to approve. Second. Second. Motion second to approve the consent agenda. Roll call. Morissette? Yes. Alms? Yes. Dazeel? Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. And Hall? Yes. Motion's approved, consent agenda is, uh, consent items are approved. Uh, discussion and possible action on resolution 3-21 Chippewa St. Croix Rail Commission. Mayor, Council, uh, this item specifically, uh, it's, it's from the Chippewa St. Croix Rail Commission. Uh, they're requesting uh, 13 uh, governmental units uh, near us to uh, participate in the commission to explore uh, passenger rail. Uh, Mike, you need more volume. Is that better? No. No. Is that better? Yep. Yes. All right. We got her. Kind of. So from the top? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the uh, Chippewa Rail or St. Croix Rail Commission is, is requesting that the city of Hudson participate. Um, along with 13 other governmental units that include counties, village, and uh, I think seven cities uh, to explore and plan for potential rail service, passenger rail service, existing, existing um, Pacific Rail. Uh, they've been working on this for about 20 years. I believe about 10 of the other municipalities and counties have already adopted resolutions to uh, participate in this commission, um, this planning group. So um, again, we're, we're requesting a seat at the table. This is not um, 
this is not going to, it doesn't it, it require us to contribute any funds or participate financially in any way. It's just having a seat at the table uh, to talk about uh, future potential rail service um, on the existing rail lines. So uh, staff recommends approval. And Mike, we're talking, this is a light rail system? Yeah, passenger rail. And again, the details, Paul, I think that's a good question. The details have not been fleshed out. I mean, we're still so very early in this um, that we all, again, we just need to be a part of the conversation uh, with our uh, other municipalities and counties. Yep. And I and I think also, um, probably not what you would think of light rail, like in the Minneapolis area, because uh, this is going to be using existing rail lines. So it would be more of an actual train um, that would be on the existing lines that are already used. And I saw from the issue sheet, it would go all the way to like Union uh, Depot in St. Paul. That's the intent. Okay. Well, I think it's a great idea. I would love to see something down the road for <laughs> transportation to uh, the Twin Cities. So I would move to um, suspend the rules at this time. Second. <sighs> All right, we got a motion and a second. Yeah, suspend the rules. Oh, that's right. Did. I did move to suspend the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Roll call. Morissette? Yes. Alms? Yes. Dazeel? Yes. Weber? Yes. Atkins Hoggett? Yes. And Hall? Yes. Motions approved. Rules are suspended. A move to adopt resolution 3 21. Second. Second. Motion and second to adopt. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Discussion of possible action on a sponsorship of NR116, uh, Clomer F and Lomer F applications for Riverfront Square at 106 Buckeye Street, Riverfront Properties, Inc. Again, uh, I want to be very clear going into this. This is not. Um, an item discussing the, the actual project itself. This is more specific to, or it is very specific to, uh, the requirements in NR 116, which is uh, pertaining to a uh, flood floodplain. Um, I'm going to ask Brian to unmute uh, David Schofield, who is one of our consulting engineers that works um, on riverway and floodplain issues with us. Uh, but again, um, he's going to go through some of the more technical aspects of this, um, but this is not, you know, we're not discussing, you know, development plans. The Council, Plan Commission uh, will have plenty of chances to talk about the actual project itself. Um, but for transparency purposes, we, we certainly wanted to, you know, include what those concept plans that the Plan Commission considered um, earlier this month, just so you could see. Um, you know what, what the what the owner and developer is, is proposing to do, uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to David, and he'll give us an overview of the technical side of what we're talking about when we use the words clomer. So, David, it looks like you're unmuted, and you're ready to go. Yeah. So the existing site where 106 Buckeye is located is actually located in the floodplain. Um, it's uh, approximately three or four feet below the floodplain elevation. It's in what's called a, um, a flood fringe, so it's not moving water, it's standing water during a flooding event. Um, the applicant has decided to raise the property out of the floodplain through fill and then build the structure. So it's a, kind of a two-step process. With that, they are requesting the city's approval of a uh, conditional letter of map revision based on fill, or a clomer. Um, once they uh, apply for that clomer, the, the actual approval will be done through FEMA, but because the city um, is the floodplain authority in this area, you have to be, an, you have to be their, essentially their sponsor before they apply to uh, FEMA. Once they uh, receive approval from FEMA, they place the fill according with their plans. Then they would fill out what's called a, a letter of map revision. So just drop the C from it. It's not, no longer conditional. It's it's the final uh, map revision. Um, and so what what I'm suggesting that the city council consider tonight is approving the uh, sponsorship of the Clomer and allowing staff to approve the Lomer when the fill has been placed. 
I think it's too early to approve the Loamer at this point because it hasn't been filled. Um, but I think that's not something that necessarily needs to come back to the city council if they if they're doing what they said they were going to do. Um, I, I think that this would be appropriate to let staff approve the Loamer in the future. Anybody? I have a couple of questions because I this was a little bit confusing when I was looking through it, so I appreciate the clarification. Question is just um, in terms of timing and process. Uh, let's say if this was approved tonight and then FEMA approved it, right? The city sponsored it. Then do the buildings have to come down for them to do the fill to bring it above the floodplain? Yes. The existing buildings will have to be demolished um, and fill placed. And, and technically, they should have the fill placed. They should do what's called an elevation certificate. They should do the Lomer application prior to going vertical. Um, I think that my understanding is the applicant is willing to take a little bit of a risk in, in doing some of the foundations prior to the for, final approval of the Lomer, uh, but that's at their risk. That's not the city's So risk. I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to ask is, and I know Mike is saying it's about the, strictly about the floodplain issue, which I understand Mike's saying, but what I'm trying to figure out is if we approve the, if we approve this, if FEMA went forward, if they did the fill, and then if the city later looked at the proposal and said, no, we don't want to do the building. I mean, is that, is that possible? I mean, is that, that's a huge risk that that person is taking. So I don't think this is just about the um, flood issue. I think this is probably also about the building itself because one would, I think, necessarily lead to the other. I would hate to leave this owner with something above a floodplain and a building that was maybe not approved by the city council at a future date. So I'm just trying to figure out the process here and, and be fair to everybody involved. Sure. So the the uh, approval of the Clomer F or the sponsorship of the Clomer F does not obligate the city to approve the, the building that will eventually or is proposed to be eventually placed on that. All, all you're doing tonight is approving the, um, the actual placement of fill. I think Mike has included the, the draft uh, plans for the site just to give you folks an understanding of what eventually is gonna come before you for uh, final approval. Um, but at this point, the only thing that, that you're being asked to approve tonight is the sponsorship of the Clomer F. I get that, but maybe and this is a question for Mike, maybe then if I'm just trying to play out this scenario, if this goes forward, they do the fill, they have to actually tear down those buildings to do the fill, correct? So yeah. then that owner is in kind of a precarious situation because the building has not necessarily been approved, but they might end up with a lot of fill and then what can they build on? I guess they could get a different design or something if the council didn't approve it. Is that kind of what they're thinking maybe? Absolutely. I mean, obviously they have, they, they're, they, they have a desire to build the building that you see before you. Mm -hmm. But again, that was, we're still at concept level. The plan commission approved the concept with many, many conditions to it. So, uh, I mean, we'll look at final development plans and then we'll also have a, ultimately a development agreement um, you know, all those things, and, and, they, and they're certainly aware of the risk associated with moving forward with the demolition of that building, knowing full well that they might not get the, the building that, that that they want. Okay, that helps me. Thank you. Hey, Mike, can you talk yes. to the condition of the current buildings there? Or is there somebody to speak to that? I can speak to it a, a little bit. I know that it's been um, it's been an issue for many, many years talking with, um, you know, David Gray, our building inspector um, and others, uh, and even his predecessor, you know, they've had nothing but issues, There's been water damage in that building. You've got, um, you've got a sidewalk with a canopy over it currently. So you've got some obstructions that, you know, that go over that existing mm -hmm. sidewalk. It's, 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 it's a building that, you know, it's probably past its, you know, mostly useful life without, you know, a ton of extra work. So, um, yes, uh, that's a good point, Bill. Is that that building is 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 somewhat of an issue, um, or had been in the past. So it's fair to say, for that property, something needs to be rectified, anyway. Correct. Yes. 
I'll move we accept the uh, sponsorship of the NR116 and the Clomer F. Got a motion? Is there a second? Yep, second. Motion and second to approve discussion. Discussion. Go ahead. Yeah, I've, I have some concerns about the, uh, of course you do. the way, and it's hard to tell from the plan how much it, it impacts or impedes the sidewalk that's there. That uh, That's really the, the natural route for us to have the bike pad path going. And uh, instead of coming way across this first street right now, we really should be crossing the on the the least trafficked sections, which would be the entrance to the boat ramp and coming across First Street on the south side of uh, whatever the hell of a sudden whatever that street is. Okay. Uh, Buckeye, thank you. Uh, I always figure out why is that one long, one block long street there, but anyhow, so that I think may affect the fill. So how, how is that feel going to affect the, uh, the drainage? How is it going to affect the sidewalk? Will, will be able, is it going to be sufficiently wide? The sidewalk there is very narrow um, and just totally inadequate, but a lot of people still use it. That's the natural route for getting to and coming from off the, uh, the, uh, the bike path going down to the bridge. So we need to, that has, I, I only raise that now because it, 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 may, inf may, uh, it may impact the, uh, the fill situation it needs to be a consideration as I'm going to, because I'm going to raise that later on as an issue when the uh, when the building design comes in. So I think we really need to. This is the last chance we have to correct that mm -hmm. that situation. I can address that. The as part of the fill, they're going to be constructing a retaining wall at the property line, mm -hmm. and um, that existing sidewalk will be replaced. Uh, as part of that retaining wall, um, five feet out into the right of way, so it'll be, it'll be where you would expect a sidewalk to be placed, and it'll be five feet wide. Will it be? But if it's on, a, if it's on fill, how's it? How's it going to ramp down to, as bicycles down to the street, down to uh, First Street? The sidewalk is, that, is not on top of the fill. The sidewalk is at the bottom side of the retaining wall. And it's only five feet wide. Yes. So that's essentially a, a three and a half foot pathway if you have bicycles. So that's that's insufficient width for sure. Mm -hmm. Is there extra room there, David? As I look at the the plan, it looks like there's a fairly large area between the sidewalk and Buckeye Street that they are proposing sodding. Would that be an expansion area to make it, it a, yeah, a full fledged trail? Yeah, if you wanted to reduce the snow storage, you could certainly widen the sidewalk and towards the roadway. I share that concern. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at the the elevation, or the it's I guess it's not an elevation; it's a a sketch, a sketch up of the proposed building. And that sidewalk that is in that sketch does not look to be five feet wide. Um, it, it just to the scale of it, just it couldn't be five feet in that drawing. Um, so five feet, I don't think there's any room to go any bigger than what it what would be five feet i'd like uh, to know if be verified if you can let me try to find the page i'm looking at it on my ipad but i'll try to find the actual page too I'm on it's page on, next to the packet it's on page 65 of the packet if you look at that um it gives you the idea of buckeyes on the lower half so okay. There is, you can see the five foot sidewalk and then you can see that area that's labeled a sod, which if that's a, if it's to scale, it looks like you've got about 10 feet of sod before you hit the, the road. Um, so you, I would think that there should be a fairly decent amount of expansion area there. I'd really like to get that verified with dimensions on that. I, I it's, still on, find it it's on page really... 54 of your plans as well. And that okay. one, and page 54, it shows the five foot width. It's actually labeled. Okay. Everybody's in our contact. Why 
quite a bit of extra sod space to Aaron's point. That, that we could we could expand further towards Buckeye. Land condition. At least three feet. Oh, I think that's important. Again, I would I would think coming out of plan commission unanimously, if we focus on what we're looking at right now, and that is not the plan we're looking at, the sponsorship for the Clomer F and the Lomer F. That's all we're doing. We have time to go through the project itself when it gets back to plan commission. Correct, Mike? Can't hear you, Mike. Yep, that's correct. But I think this conversation just <laughs> kind of pertains to some of the 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 filling is what Jim pointed out. But he if we need it, now would be the time. David just said that's not it doesn't have anything to do with the sidewalk. Right. We the got fill. That. It sounds like we have sufficient space to do what we need to do. I would say so, yes. For what it's worth too, Dean also let me know that, you know. For the sanitary sewer upsizing that's going to have to happen there by year 2025 you know we'll be reconstructing that street too so that'll give us some ad additional wiggle room if we need it okay anybody else everybody good all those in favor aye 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 opposed motions approved <clears throat> Excuse me. Discussion of possible action on public comments during council meetings. Who's up? Councilmember Hall had requested that this be added um, to the agenda, so um, it's on there. I provided some additional information um, in the packet related to um, what our codes, what our ordinance says about comments during the meeting, what our practice has been more recently, and then what um, I think the, the legal opinion from the League of Wisconsin Municipalities on um, comments during meetings and things like that. So um, I'm not sure if there's more specific questions or changes that the council's requesting. Well, I wanted to hear what the other council members um, thought about this. Um, several years ago, we had some concerns because um, uh, people didn't wanted to comment about things and they weren't allowed to because the item kept uh, being put on the agenda. And so they couldn't uh, comment during the public comments um and then uh, when the item came up uh they weren't allowed to comment so we talked about that afterwards um and decided that we would allow public comments during the meeting after all our job is to listen to constituents and to find out what the people are thinking so um i um, have concerns about shutting people out of the uh the meetings and not getting opinions. I, I have those same concerns. Uh, but I point out that the on the agenda, the comments and suggestions from Susan present say that the mayor may allow comments during on an, on an item, agenda item. And but at the top, it says that it will not be allowed. So that's the way it so somehow right now we have a disconnect between what we're saying, if I read these two things correctly. Um, I, I'm not certain what change, you know, after Aaron, after reading through what you said and then the legal opinions, trying to understand the different designations. Um, I'm not sure how we would want to change what we're, why we'd want to change what we're doing now. So basically, if you want the, the difference is, is that the way our ordinance is really set up is that we allow for, we're supposed to allow for limited public comments, limited public hearings, which means that we have controls in place so that 
we allow for citizen comments during the citizen comment period. We allow for comments during, um, you know, public hearings that are posted as public hearings. Now our code does say that the, the mayor may allow comments during other times. Now, by just openly allowing comments on every item, which is what our practice has been recently, um, that then creates, instead of a limited um, public hearing, we're basically creating an open public hearing. And the issue with that that the league says is then you don't have any control. People can comment on anything they want to, whenever they want to, you can't stop them, you can't, you know, clearly if somebody says things that are wildly inappropriate, but in general, that if you're creating an open public hearing, everything is open. And if someone wants to speak for as long as they want to speak, we can't limit them, we can't focus them to a topic because we've created basically an open public forum, no different than, as they say in that memo, a sidewalk where you know it's a public sidewalk you are allowed to protest you are allowed to speak you are allowed to you know do whatever you want to do because that's a you know a kind of an open area so like i said as the league memo states they do not recommend allowing people to comment on every item and so what i had said was yes our ordinance or our ordinance says that the mayor may allow people to comment on items if necessary and i guess what my recommendation would be is to keep a structure to it is that if the mayor or council feels that we should take public comments on something let's notice it as a public hearing let's make it completely clear to everyone out there that this item is up for discussion and we can do it at a regular meeting. We can do it as part of a special meeting. I know Jim, you had sent me like an example from Eau Claire. Well, they had an item that they wanted public input on. So they created a standalone public hearing so they could get that input on it. Um, but the concern that gets raised is allowing people just to weigh in on every agenda item, um, which is what we've been doing um, without fail. It's been, you know, somebody will chime in and say, oh, I'd like to talk about that. And we just allow it to occur. Um, and, you know, I recognize the council's concerns about limiting public input, but the public is outside of citizen comments and public hearings, the public is really supposed to contact their elected officials. The council's elected to represent the public and they're supposed to contact you to voice your concerns. And then you as their elected representatives are supposed to represent them in council meetings. Um, and by what we're doing is, is we're turning our whole meeting into an open public forum. Um, and that's where I have concerns. And again, this is obviously has come to more of a head more recently, but you know, to be very honest, I brought this up in my very first council meeting um, where the mayor said, you know, does anybody want to comment on this? And I turned to him and said, what are you doing? Um, I have never seen that before. Um, and I expressed my concerns you know, initially with that. And again, it's not always an issue, but I do think that we should be very consistent with how we do this. Um, and that's what that's why I'm recommending this is how we move forward. I think uh, to that point, I mean, I, I think some of the issue just from my perspective is, is sort of the technology piece, right? Ever since COVID, um, it is now easier for public comment if we are opening up that door uh, during, during pieces for people to not have to go to City Hall, just log on to Zoom and make comments. So I don't know. I guess I don't know what, what opinion I have per se, but I just wanted to bring that up. Jim, just one thing that you, you had indicated, you thought that there was a contradiction in the language where we were allowing it, not allowing it. I, I, I think if you reread right. that, you'll see that, that there, I, I don't see the contradiction in the language. It says public comments will not be taken during council meeting on any agenda item that is not a public hearing and down in the comments and suggestions section it says where to say that oh i'm sorry i wasn't looking at the top okay so and and that and the second one is what our ordinance allows and that not correct they can, so are we looking for a change in the ordinance or are we looking to change in in, in our behavior Is there an ordinance and what when we allow when you as a, as a presiding officer, when you allow comments. Is there an ordinance? Well, I think the clarification I, to, to fix your one thing on top, Jim, is where public comments will not be taken during the council meeting on any agenda item that is not listed as a public hearing. I think it's just been adding or citizen comments um, or during the citizen comment agenda section. Um, I think that's 
the only place where to, to fix that issue. Um, as Commons and Suggestions is an agenda item that is basically calling for Commons and Suggestions. But to clarify that, um, just adding that, um, you know, comments on the, are not allowed on any agenda item that's not um, listed as a public hearing or during the citizen comments section of the agenda. Um, but then the next part of it, where you talk about, do we need to change our ordinance? We don't. Um, you know, our ordinance already addresses this. You know, we're, the, the mayor may do it um, during items that, that, you know, he feels fit that, that we should take additional comment on. I guess what I'm saying is, is to be consistent. If the mayor, under the advice of the council, feels that we should take comments on an item, I think that we should postpone mm -hmm. that item and notice it as a public hearing so all citizens know no, that they're able to comment on it, not just those that, it, that attended that night. Yes, I, I can understand that perspective. I'm still seeing the conflict, though, on the current agenda that Jim sees. So I think it needs to be scrutinized a little closer before that language that is on our agenda is finalized. I see it as as the con you know the same conflict that Jim sees. Right, and I, th and I think again, like I said, to address that, I'll just add or during citizen comment period. Um, another concern that I've heard is that um, somebody tried to use the mayor and council at HudsonWisconsin.gov and it wasn't successful. When you send things out here into the Council, it just says council at hudsonwi.gov. Right. So, Brian, I don't know. I, I have not heard from anybody that, that that new one doesn't work. I have not heard either. Um, the reason why we created the mayor and council mm -hmm. was so the public knew that the mayor was included in that. Yeah, we just oh. wanted to make it really clear that this is a, a email that goes to everyone. So we'll we'll test that to find out. I nobody had notified me that that, that email address was not working. So we'll find oh. out about that. Yeah, I just got an inquiry saying, did you get my email? And I said no, and um, uh, asked which email address was used, and uh, they responded that it was the mayor and council one. So um, I don't I don't know what happened. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll find out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so go ahead. Also, the link above there doesn't work either. Okay. Council contact information can be found here, and then it says Mayor and Common Council. That that goes to 400 bed request. Right. <laughs> it's a weird thing where it says Link Protect. Is what's that about, Brian? Because that is the right e email address. We'll have to look at that, but that is the correct email address. If you type that in, that would be the right one. Where do you see that? At when you click on Mayor and Common Council. Because that is the correct email address if you hand type it in. So I'm not sure why it does that when it redirects out of the agenda. I guess I still see a... Um, we shut down a, an avenue that we've been using for the last couple of years. It's been fairly successful, mm -hmm. um, I, I think. Uh, sometimes it's gotten out of control or it's, been, it's made meetings longer than we want it to be. But that's not the purpose, is the length of the meeting, whether it's long or not, hearing the comments. I guess, Rich, I would ask, Mr. Mayor, I would ask if, uh, how would you judge that something needed more citizen input if we didn't have an audience or if no one had the ability to input anything on the on the agenda item, how would you judge that? Well, again, I think as Bill pointed out, right now it's a technology problem. If we if we are having the in-person meetings, we'd be able to tell, you know, would people raise their hand or whatever, want to come forward. Uh, right now, <clears throat> obviously it has been, you know, if they have something to say, I've encouraged them to just chime in because I can't see if they've raised their hand and I don't, I'm not looking at the screen that either Brian or Aaron are looking at. So I don't have the luxury of seeing if somebody has raised their hand that way. So normally what we do is just uh, hear what they have to say and uh, you know when they chime in and, and I guess if it's out of order, it would have to be declared out of order. I think everybody here understands that um, 
I have been, uh, I, I have, if, if there's an error, I've erred on the side of allowing people to speak. And, yeah. and I mean, you know that. I would think that everybody would agree with that. Absolutely. And so, uh, but it has, you know, it has gotten out of hand in the last, or had gotten out of hand in the three, four prior meetings before, before the, uh, we, we started doing something a little bit different. And I think people were actually taking advantage of the situation. So I, I think I agree that something needed to be done. And of course, the council, when Aaron put his, put his uh, suggestion out there, everybody agreed, the entire council agreed that something needed to be done. So I would say, you know, it's, uh, let's just keep, keep doing what we're doing. If it becomes a problem, um, we can address it again. That would be my recommendation. I would just say with the way things are right now, let's just keep doing that. I know that we got some emails from some people that thought that their voices had been stifled, but um, if they tried to speak, they, you know, they, uh, on, on issues that were important, they were able to do so. I think that you know, if we go down this road, stay, stay on this road, that when there's an issue in front of us and somebody has uh, something to say that is being impacted directly by that issue, I think that's an important voice to hear. So can I clarify, I'm sorry, Mayor. So you want to just allow people to comment? Well, I'm thinking okay. that, we, that we do, well, I, I think that what we need to do, first of all, is come to some resolution on the contradiction between the first paragraph at the top of the agenda and the actual statement in, uh, in comments and suggestions. I know that we have an ordinance right now that's in place, and, and I think that we follow the ordinance, and maybe Kathy will read that. Well, are you talking about Aaron 23-12C? No person other than a member shall address the council except, except under order of business 23-5D, which is the public comment. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what the contradiction is that we're referring to other than it says on the very top in the bold where you can only comment during public hearing, but it should be added or during the citizen comment section. But we do other have than that. I don't see a contradiction. We do have an ordinance here. Yeah, so the ordinance does say except that citizens may address the council with permission of the presiding officer as to matters which are be cons being considered by the council at that time. So that means outside the public comment period and based on the agenda. I mean, there's two issues with that, that some people may say, well, you didn't notice that as a public hearing, and if I knew we could come down and do that, you know, if it had been noticed as a public hearing, I would have come down. So it's a notice problem. And um, I don't know that I agree totally that it turns it into a public forum because the open meeting law requires that obviously the discussion has to pertain only to items on the agenda. But That's by the council. So I guess what I'm saying is, is if you read this league memo on this, I mean, you, Kathy, if, the, if you don't agree with the league memo, I, that's completely fine. If you don't agree with their opinion, then, then let us know that. But I mean, basically what it's saying is, is that if we allow comments on any topic at any time, we can't control those comments based on topic. It, it says right on there, um, let's see. For example, if the governing body permits public commentary at some times, but not others, or allows some persons to speak, but not others, the governing body opens itself up to claims the differential treatment is content or viewpoint based, or that the, you know, and the regulations aren't reasonable or sufficiently defined. So what they say is, is that if you keep it to the designated areas of public hearings or citizen comments, you, you're fine. But if you allow people just to comment at any time that they're you have to be open to the fact that people can basically comment and keep saying what they want to say, well, first, which is fine. If the council wants to operate it that way, just yes, just recognize that you can't pick an item and say we're not taking comments on this item. If you open up agenda item, you know whatever it would be. So tonight, if we're talking about the you know the Clomar and the Lomar, and we allow people to comment on that, and then we move on to the to the mask issue. We can't say no, you can't comment. We have to allow everybody that wishes to comment to comment. Um, we're, we're not allowed to pick and choose on the items. Yes, so, I which agree. Is, which, is, which is fine, but then just recognize that every item we have to allow people to be able to comment on, on everyone. We can't stop commentary. 
um, and we can't um, you know, pick and choose items that we would rather not have comment on. I agree, the consistency is, in terms of topics, it has to relate to the agenda, but it does lengthen and it's hard to control. And you can't control unless you set some controls. And I do think that the control you're setting or proposing, Aaron, is if it looks like a lot of people want to comment on something, then maybe the council should consider having a public hearing on it right. at a different time, not at that meeting, because it wasn't noticed as a public hearing. That's basically what you're suggesting, right, Aaron? And right. I agree with that, because I think you lose control of your meeting. If you recall, and I think it was said, you know, on the mask ordinance that everyone will be allowed to be able to con comment. Then the, half the agenda had to be delayed. So the idea is you do have business that's on the agenda that you really do need to get done. And I think what we're trying to do is get people to, to talk with their elected officials beforehand and the elected officials can bring that forward at the council discussion, at their discussion of the matter. It's just, a, it's a matter of controlling your meeting so that you can get through the agenda and treat everyone equally and fairly. And you can best do that by limiting comments to the public comment period and having residents talk to their elected officials beforehand so they can br the elected officials can bring those concerns to the discussion when the council is deliberating and it's just a it's and if it sounds like there's a lot of public concern and interest then you can notice it as a public hearing and then then you know you're going to have a public hearing. I, I, I like that. I, I, what I've always been confused by is why people cannot comment on agenda items under citizen comments. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's never really made a lot of sense to me. And so I think what we should do is actually open up the citizen comments on anything, whether it's on the agenda or not. But what we should do is limit the time that they're allowed to speak. So if it's like a three minute period or whatever we agree on, that's their three minutes. They can talk about an agenda item. They can talk about a non-agenda item. They can talk about whatever they want. But then I think when we get into business, I don't think we should have public comment because it's really intrusive and it's hard to have a conversation between us when people keep jumping in. Part of it is the technology Bill's talking about, but also during a regular meeting when we're present. So my, my suggestion would be limit public comments to like three minutes on anything you want to talk about. You know, public comments at the beginning of the meeting and then don't have the comments during the meeting. And if we need to change the ordinance, I'm happy to change the ordinance if that's the direction people would want to go. You know, Paul, here's my problem with that. We have in, in, in comments that people have made uh, when when the items have come up on the agenda, we are able to have some type of exchange with them. We can't have that exchange in citizen comments. That's number one. Number two is that we have, and we've experienced this before with citizen comments, we have things that need to get done during the course of the meeting. And there are people here that either live or, or on Zoom that have items that affect them on that agenda. And, uh, and they are oftentimes paying for legal counsel to be here and other expertise to be here. And those people are on the clock and they have to sit and wait for citizen comments to end before their items come up on the agenda. And you've seen this in the past where we've actually had to postpone items and take them over to another council meeting. And again, those people were sitting here in the audience and they're on the clock and they, they have to pay for that. So I, I, if, what I, what I would like to do, if this becomes a problem, is I'd like to move citizen comments to the very end of the agenda. And I know that there are a lot of municipalities that do that. Now, if we were to do that, then of course that wouldn't allow for what you want to do, and that is to have people comment on agenda items because the agenda would already have been completed by the time they could comment. 
But you know, that's, that's another way to accommodate the work that needs to get done here is to put citizen comments at the very end. And uh, like I said, there are a, a quite a few municipalities and some of them are neighboring municipalities that do that or don't allow citizen comments at all. That's something that I don't know that Kathy even brought up is that we don't have to allow them, but we do. So, and, I, and I'm not suggesting that we don't. I, I think it's important and I like to hear what people have to say, but that's something else that we could do is put them at the very end. But would you agree that we kind of know when a lot of people are gonna turn out for an issue? We kind of know. Usually, <laughs> not always, but usually. But if it's like a development piece, right? If it's like a mass thing, if it's a controversial thing, I'm saying, and I think that's what Aaron's point is, if you know it's gonna be a pretty contentious issue with a lot of people, then you would set up a public hearing. Yep. I think at the average meeting, what I'm suggesting would probably work if you did three minutes of public input um, and control the time. I think you could do that on, on pretty much the average meeting. But you're right, if it's if it's very contentious, then I don't want to see the business delayed. So I, I hear you on that. Well, I'd like, yeah, I guess. To, I'd like to try to, to do what Aaron is suggesting and uh, and like you say, Paul, you know, we, we have usually have a pretty good idea what that's going to, you know, uh, if, a, if an issue is going to be contentious enough, it's going to draw a lot of opinion uh, that we could just declare it a public hearing. You know, we can set a set a date for a public hearing. I think that makes a lot of sense and then have it specifically as an agenda item. And people would be, you know, discussing that that item when it comes up on the agenda. Yeah, that makes sense. We need some yeah. procedures about how we declare that. An item that's going to public hearing right well so, and that's part of the uh, next uh, item on the agenda which is the agenda prep um i've got a question about the public hearing though um what are the rules for conducting a public hearing can we um make any rules about how long somebody can speak or whether um they have to live in the city, things like that. What, yes. what rules can we? We can do that. Yes, we can, can do those things. Yep. But we have to be consistent. You really have wide open ability yes. to set any controls you want on public comments. On a public hearing. Correct. Sarah? Even the ones that the state requires? What's that, Joyce? Even ones that the state requires? Yeah, in terms of you can to control the public hearing. I mean, to make sure everyone gets a chance, you can limit the time or say try to keep your comments limited. Many people say if you've had heard, if someone's already brought forth the concern you had, you just you know say don't repeat it. Just say I agree with that or something like. I mean, there's ways to make them more efficient that you can implement. Okay. okay. So, uh, what would be the process? Sorry, do you want to go or right. do you want me to? Go ahead. What would be the process then? So, let's say we have our meeting. The opening is just like, say, even it was today, there was a, a call for uh, suggest, comments and suggestions from citizens present. People do or don't speak. And then we go on through our meeting. We get to an agenda item that maybe we thought was not going to be something that people were passionate about, but when we started discussing it, it turned into maybe something that we thought we wanted to turn to a public hearing later so we could get that. What, what would someone just withdraw a motion and then put a new motion on the table to call that to a public hearing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then it would go out a couple weeks? Is that the process for that? I would think so, yes, that if the council feels that they'd like to have a hearing on it, it would be a motion to set a public hearing, and then it can either be at the next council meeting or you can call for a special meeting at any time, as long as we have the 24-hour notice. Um, you know, you could call for a special meeting, too. Uh, but, yes, it would just be a motion to, to set the hearing and then a vote on that. You know, I, if, if, if I could interrupt here for a moment, uh, I, think, I think also if somebody had an idea of something they wanted to put on the agenda, they may think that it would warrant a public hearing because there's going to be sufficient uh, conversation about it. And so rather than putting it first on the agenda for discussion, they can put it on the agenda for a public hearing and then we move into the next meeting for, uh, or maybe even in the same meeting. Mm -hmm. 
uh, have the public hearing kind of like we do on you know the other public hearing stuff that we have at the top of the deal so anybody that wants something on the agenda can say I'd like this on the agenda but I think it's going to generate enough conversation that we ought to hold a public hearing on it first and we can do this both of them at the same time on the agenda does that make right. sense I think that makes sense to me and like for example tonight if you looked at our agenda I think you'd probably pick one item um, that maybe you'd want to potentially see as a public hearing yeah so I'd like to point out then that the last or the second the second two sentences on item number five in our agenda read as presiding officer the mayor may allow public comment on agenda items during discussion by the common council following a motion and a second being made on said agenda item so i think we need to strike those two sentences if we're going to implement what we're saying or at least consider that right that's the conflict i'm seeing so we're saying we're not going to do it but then he can sometimes the mayor can I'm still confused as to what direction we're uh, we're headed. I hear both both conversations. Go on. well. Go. If, continue doing what we're doing, but if we realize we've got a lot of discussion, then we move it to a public hearing for more discussion than we want. That's that's that, I, you know, that's a judgment call, probably mostly by by. Uh, you rich or, or by Aaron no that would be that, by the request that of the council member. yeah the, the council can just council can say you know what it looks like sure. we've got people here that would like to comment on this so I would I would move that we just close the debate right now put this out for public hearing at the next meeting and keep the item on the agenda for the next meeting as well I I, I look to Aaron to help us with that because we get involved in the in the discussions and, and may lose sight of that we're that we're going off track so yes I'd, I'd be happy to do that any, any of us can but I, I would really be looking for Aaron to help with the monitoring the meeting for us yep I, I can definitely do that and then also Sarah I, I understand what you were saying about that um that line and if that's the direction we're heading I will definitely strike that then under under five so is there anything here that we need a motion and to vote on no. I don't know I do not believe there is okay okay thank you all right we good I, I just have to say I'm, I'm not in particular agreement with with uh, not allowing at least some public discussion at our meetings and that that's going to be the indicator as to whether or not we need to to a generator public hearing because we're doing everything we can to shut down discussion. Oh, we're not. Why would people bother? So we need to, you know, we've, we've limited the ability to input to a few people getting uh, uh, the agenda on Friday afternoon and over the weekend sending one of us an email. So I that's <laughs> not a, not going in the right direction. And I, I just, I guess I want to say that the intent of this is not to limit public input, but is to set controls and is to set the process for the meeting to be conducted in a way that allows for the council to have full discussion and not allow for um, non council members to, at times, provide direction um, as far as the conversation goes. And again, I'm not recommending this as something unusual um, this is definitely the most common way that council meetings are run and um, I am just trying to make sure I raise the concern that the way we're doing it is basically creating a public open public hearing for every item um, and that is not a common way to do it that is in um, that is definitely not in line with what the League of Wisconsin Municipalities legal opinion on running council meetings is. And again, the intent is to not limit public input, it's to structure that public input. And it's to make sure that the public is communicating with their elected officials 
in providing their input. It's to make sure that um, the, all the public knows, not just those that show up, if an agenda item is open for uh, public input or not. Um, and by allowing for that with proper notice so that they can do that. Um, and so again, I, I don't want this to be structured as it's a way to, to silence people. It, that's not the intent of it. The intent of it is to set a very common structure for how council meetings are run um, and to follow that and to be consistent with it. Um, and to uh, obviously, of course, set a way that we can make sure that everyone knows that this topic is open for discussion. Please provide your input during a public hearing, things like that. Um, so, you know, again, I, I just want to make sure that it's looked at in the, in the intent that it is, is that um, it's not to limit, it's to structure and to provide the proper notice that it's going right. to be occurring. I, I agree with the intent, but I think the the methodology does limit automatically. Correct. So I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about that. I do like that we're starting to at least put a link on the on the uh, agenda so mm -hmm. they can quickly get something into us. It's a, a little a little bo little bit more response friendly. And I like I like the it idea works. that they can send it to all of us at the same time and. Uh, so that we all get that information uh, because, you know, as it is, we don't know what other people are hearing from constituents or people outside of the city and uh, um, unless it's sent to all of us at the same time. Well, we've had, in, in other discussions we've had, we've all come up with the, uh, we've talked about the people that we have talked with that have communicated with us, that always comes up. Yeah, but you know, sometimes it's helpful to get a copy of what they're saying so that well, that's true. It's not subject to somebody's interpretation, or whether you believe it or not. Yeah, <laughs> not that we'd ever do that. But. I beg your pardon. Jim. <laughs> so, Aaron, what you're really saying is that if we leave things open. Somebody could just come in, blather on for 20 minutes, and we can't stop them? You know, and, and again, it, this is, I'm reading off the league's legal opinion on it, and, and basically what they're, they're saying is, is you lose that ability to control your meeting and what's being said at it and how long when you allow it to happen at any time. Um, so if you, for some reason, try to stop someone, they definitely have a reason to challenge that because you didn't stop the person before them just because of the person before them was you know if, if it's always a constant you're allowing it to occur on every agenda item it opens the city up to that concern that if you your ability to control the meeting is greatly reduced and again i want to refer back to the league legal opinion on this not my opinion on the effectiveness of how a meeting should be run it's it's what the league says and what their recommendation is is how we should conduct our meetings doesn't the county are they used to it that require if you want to speak require you sign in below with it it's that's not so easy to do now that we have have uh, zoom meetings so it's a, a little bit more difficult but they might and you know it, Jim, when, and, and I don't know how you verify that, right? Because we've had people that have come in and spoken and told us they live in the city and we find out they don't. Uh, you know, they give us addresses and we all look at each other and say, is that in the city or not? <laughs> and uh, so we don't. Well, I, I check them. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, so we, I mean, they, who knows what they put down, right? We don't know. They, we don't know that it's actually them that signs in, the person that says that, that's talking. It's difficult. It's a technological problem. So where are we at? I don't believe that there's any action that needs to be taken. I, from what I see, the sort of consensus with concern is that um, we proceed in this manner where not every topic is open for comment um, and that uh, we'll clean up some of the agenda or, or some of the notices on, uh, wording on the agenda to make that clear um, and that uh, either when an agenda item is added if we feel 
at that time, either the if the council member is requesting it or if myself or the mayor feels that that's going to be a topic that's going to generate discussion, we'll post it on the agenda as a public hearing. If it's not, but during the council conversation on something, if it starts to move into something that is a little broader than what we all expected, um, I'll be happy to jump in and, and or any council member may and say, I think this should be added to a future agenda as a public hearing. Um, and we can have a vote on that. And then also setting when that would be either if it's a topic that re requires immediate addressing, we can look at a special meeting within the next, you know, few days, or we would look at adding it to the future, uh, the next regular agenda as a hearing. Um, so I believe that's where we're at right now. We good? Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, discussion of possible action on agenda preparation. Joyce? So I brought this up because um, in a discussion with Aaron, uh, you know, he looked at the ordinance and it was, just wasn't clear as far as um, what whether there were rules or anything as far as the agenda prep and I just wanted to find out what others think as far as it, what um, what should be expected that you know if somebody asks for it does it have to be put on the agenda or you know if one of the council members asked or do, you, do we want to have some some rules um, and um, you know, I'm thinking that if two people ask, then it really does need to be on the, the agenda for sure. Um, but I wanted to find out what other people's thoughts were on, on the agenda items and how it's prepared. So do you have examples of items that people have asked to have on the agenda that haven't been put on the agenda? Well, there have just been times when I've had some, I don't, I don't have any specific examples, but there have been some times when I've asked for things and um, it hasn't gotten on the agenda. So, um, yeah, I've got some concerns about that. But you don't, so, you know, is there, I guess the, I'd like to ask Aaron if, could you please send out to the council members um, the, the wording of the, the ordinance? And um, so that we can see whether we, whether the other council members would like to make some adjustments to it, or uh, whether they're satisfied with the way that it's it's worded. I can send out that wording to the council for future discussion. You just tell okay. Them, tell them what it is. Thank you. I'll just are you if if you're talking about 23-18 where it says the mayor is responsible for creating the agenda along with the clerk is that what you're referring to Joyce? Yes. And um, there's been several league articles on this. Basically, you know, the, your rules for setting the agenda is a a council function. What this does is it in my opinion, it doesn't, it puts the responsibility on the mayor to prepare an appropriate agenda, com, you know, com, in compliance with the open meeting law and so forth. But the mayor has no extra authority to determine, well, this goes on and this doesn't go on. And I, um, I haven't been involved in that process, but I think that's the intent of this section of the code is to make sure someone's responsible for preparing and properly um, posting and so forth the agenda. Um, I, my understanding of your process is that people contact the mayor or there's always a um, section on the agenda for items for future agendas. And so th those are the times council brings up yes, I'd like to see such and such on the agenda, but it's really, uh, there are no statutes um, other than the open meeting law, of course, but in terms of how something goes on the agenda, that's up to the council to decide. Ryan, can you unmute Sarah, please? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Does anybody have any comments or concerns? Yeah. Thanks. I want to, yes, Joyce. What I want to do is just share a little bit about my, about my own experience, and this might be helpful too. Because um, there's uh, there's a bit. So what I do when I have an idea is I send it both to the city administrator and the mayor, 
to have an agenda item placed on. Um, in some cases, they're placed on as is. In some cases, if there's concerns or questions, the mayor or the city administrator will get back to me with some questions. And uh, just quite frankly and honestly, that's been helpful for my own mm -hmm. um, learning and also for my own shaping up things in a better format. So um, I think some of the, I don't know if some of this is coming from you know, some of the work I've been doing, talking about like a citizen advisory board in the past, and then it's not showing up. I, I want people to know that that's because I, I've withdrawn things um, at certain points based on more information to try to come back with a better proposal. So I, I guess I want to just let the public know, I don't think there's anything nefarious going on. I don't think there's anything controlling going on. I felt like it's been an open and honest process in my dealings with both, you know, the mayor and the city administrator. So I think part of it is um, ourselves as um, members of this council, we, we can have ideas and refine ideas and wait for ideas and formulate ideas. And sometimes things aren't ready for public consumption and sometimes they are, so to speak. So I just want, I think part of it might have be coming out of that and just, I'm trying, I'm trying to share my own experience and just say, mm -hmm. I've had a good experience with that. And it's been a learning experience for me because I don't always, I'm human being, I don't always get it right. So um, I don't have a difficulty with the way it's working um, as is. Okay. Neither, I'll jump in real quick. Neither do I, Joyce, I mean, respectfully, okay. I think Mm -hmm. I, I think that this has been uh, working quite well for the, at least the time I've been here and further past. If anything, if I forgot something or someone forgot, you, you say it at a meeting or you send an email out and it gets put back on the following agenda. I've never had an issue with it. Okay. It's, it's kind of been always been between the administrator and the mayor has always put the agenda gather and this is the first time and I don't know how many years I've heard there was an issue. Okay. So. Thank you. Does anybody else have some concerns? All right. Well then I think we're done. Thank you. All right. Uh, diversity committee. Uh, discussion of possible action regarding diversity committee. Paul. Yeah. Thanks Mr. Mayor. So I, I this is something I've just been thinking about since really the lakefront park kind of open forum that we had i believe it was last september and i've kind of been referring to this but not quite sure you know how to do it and so um, i do want to talk about some reasons i think why it would be really helpful to uh, have the city um, work toward uh, creating a diversity equity inclusion advisory committee and also some benefits from this city so i just have a few things listed that i want to talk about and then i want to open it up obviously for discussion so my first point is I think um, local government should represent all people and safeguard their rights. So additional input regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think would benefit our leadership as we work to better meet the needs of all citizens. Second, I think that Mayor O'Connor has worked to address concerns related to creating more civil discourse among differing uh, opinions through the Golden Rule Initiative and I think a diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory committee would build upon that initiative by expanding respect and understanding toward all people in public policy and in city programming. Third, I think another rationale is that presently we are reviewing and establishing the city of Hudson's comprehensive plan and public input from a diverse population can help us formulate a stronger and more inclusive community during the upcoming decades because that plan is gonna be for 20 years. Um, how, how would Hudson benefit from having a diversity, equity, inclusion committee? Um, I have five uh, areas off the top of my head, and I'm sure there's a whole lot more that um, other folks can chime in with. But the first one is I, I think we would have increased business and tourist activity, tourism, by promoting a safe and inclusive environment for all residents, businesses, and visitors. Second, I think as Hudson uh, evolves and our population becomes more diverse, this committee could help promote and celebrate cultural awareness. Third, I think increased citizen participation in government and local activities uh, would be promoted for all people. Fourth, I think that there would be feedback and advice for the Common Council as well as the City of Hudson staff on creating and implementing more inclusive public policy and programs. 
And fifth, I think this committee would really open up access to more grants or other resources to bring about positive changes in Hudson. So I just, I just see a lot of rationale and I really see a lot of benefits to creating this and a lot of other cities have it. I guess the last thing I wanna say is I also encourage us all to really think about diversity in a very broad framework, that there's many things that diversity includes, you know, physical abilities and ages and genders, right? And cultures and races and religion, and we could go on and on. But I just think we'd be a stronger community. I think our government would be better. I think our services would be better. Um, I think the other thing is, and I keep thinking about this today, I don't know how else to say it, but we don't know what we don't know. So uh, we all have need for awareness. And I think that a diversity committee could really do some good work for us. So what I'm really looking for tonight, and I wanna hear more first, but my, my uh, uh, motion is gonna be really to have direct the city staff to work with like coming up with a vision, a mission, some goals for such a diversity and equity and inclusion um, committee. Um, but I don't have the framework. I'd really like the city to take the leadership and kind of work on that. So I'll sit back and kind of listen to your concerns, questions, thoughts. Anybody? Paul, did you happen to take a look? You said other cities have had that. Do you have any, um, concrete examples or would that be one of the things that we would maybe be including to direct staff to do? Yeah, we're really, yeah example. Really, thanks, sorry. I would really direct staff to do it. I know that uh, on, it was a December actually agenda. I know that Aaron yep. put some of those on there. And I remember talking about the, I think it's San Juan Obisable in California, mm -hmm. but there was a few other ones too. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Um, I know the National League of Cities gives awards now for cities that are doing really um, kind of upfront diversity work. So um, there's a lot of resources, but I really think the city staff, it would be best, I think, if they took the leadership and really kind of developed the framework for that and then brought it back to us to, you know, for more input and, and, and approval sometime down the road, so. I will second your motion. Was was there a motion? Oh. Well, I didn't formally make it. I said I have a motion, but. Um, <laughs> okay. I can make it if you want. So I have it written up here, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, my motion is to direct city staff to write a framework to establish the vision, mission, and goals for a Hudson Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Committee and bring it back to the Common Council for more discussion within four weeks. I will second that. All right, we got a motion to second. Is there a discussion? And then I, I just want to clarify for Aaron and the staff, that the reason I was saying just four weeks is that um, I want to give you guys time to kind of lay a foundation, um, but I also want to make sure that we um, kind of get rolling on it rather than leave it too ambiguous. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. If that time frame needed to be extended, you know, we could talk about that too. But I just kind of want to get something up or we can come back to it and, and really um, give more input or direction to it at that time. So anybody else? Yeah. Paul, I think that. Uh it's obvious that you've done a lot of thinking about this and um, I agree with you. This would be beneficial to our city and um, I think that we do need to, uh, to explore it further. Hi, and I would agree. There's, there's been quite an undercurrent for the last four or five years in the city about the, the need for this. All right, anybody else? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Uh, discussion of possible action on a motion to rescind the motion adopted on September 8th, 2020 to deny approval of ordinance 15-20 and resolution 16-20, declaring an emergency in the city of Hudson and establishing COVID-19 prevention and control measures. Does everybody understand what we're doing here? Paul, this is yours, right? So. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. It's pretty complicated, but let me just tell you where this is coming from. Um, we saw when the Wisconsin Senate and then the Wisconsin Assembly um, revoked the governor's mask mandate, right? And then we saw, I don't know if it was an hour or two later, the governor restated the mask mandate. And I don't know if this is going back and forth, but for me as a public official, that was just too, I was very uncomfortable with it. And we are still in the midst of 
uh, the pandemic. And if anybody's seen the numbers, January, um, you know, we've had deaths off the chart nationwide, over 400,000 people. And um, county numbers are better right now than they were in December, but we, we are not out of the woods yet. And so my concern is that if the state legislature was to go forward again and rescind or, or override whatever word, I'm not sure the legal term, Kathy, for the governor's uh, mask mandate, and let's say the governor didn't come back, we, our hands are sort of tied from talking to Kathy and she can clarify this more uh, by what we did on September 8th. So really the intent of what I'm trying to do tonight is to put us in a better position where we're not hamstrung by the September 8th vote we took on masks, but we would actually be free if there was a situation where we don't have coverage for a state mandate, for mask mandate, where we would be free to put up a new emergency order. So that's that's the entire point of it. And Kathy, you, you're much more of a legal scholar than I am. So maybe if there's anything I left out, if you wanna um, clarify Yeah, that. I thought you did a good job, Paul. It basically yeah. clears the deck. Um, it doesn't adopt anything. It doesn't, it just neutralizes the topic. And um, that's, that's the point of, uh, point of the rescission. Paul, was that a motion? Um, yeah, I would make a, a motion to uh, rescind. I don't have the number, I guess, but it's the September 8th uh, emergency mask mandate. Is that close enough, Kathy? Well, it was your, yeah, sir, uh, the motion, oh, the reason why it's so wordy is I tried to use the, the language of the motion. The motion at that time was to deny approval of both the ordinance 15-20 and resolution 16-20. Um, and that's what Paul is proposing to, at least wants to make a motion to rescind that September 8th decision of the council. I'll second that motion. We got a motion and a second. A discussion? I, I like uh, the direction we're taking here in that we're being held politically captive by the legislature and by the governor. And I don't know who's, who's really interested, who really cares about us, but we should. Mm -hmm. I have a quick comment. I'm going to uh, be voting no on this, and it's going to stand um, to what I firmly believe in, is that we don't have staff on hand that are health experts. And so if we were to consider a, a mask mandate in the future, I always look to staff to, to advise and recommend. And absent that, um, I don't think that we should as a community be doing a, a mask mandate. So I just wanted to put that out there. I guess the only other thing I want to say is it's a, it's a timing thing too, right? So thank God that vaccines are rolling out and hopefully this summer we're in a different position than we're in right now in February. So at some point, you know, we won't need a backup or an emergency order for this type of stuff, but we're just not there yet. So I want to just provide that flexibility for us that if we, we need to do this for the next couple months or whatnot, that we're just in a position where we could propose something. So anybody else? All right, we've got a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Motion's approved. Uh, oh, my screen went dead here. I think that's it. I don't, uh, I don't have anything. Um, happy President's Day to everybody. We're the only ones working today. Uh, hey, we, we'll be happy if you want to change that. Just uh, let us know. Yeah, I'm sure you would. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love seeing you working. Uh, so that's all I've got. Anybody? Anything? I just want to say congratulations to all the sports in the Hudson High School, all the, the sectionals and state bound people, and tomorrow is a primary vote. There you go. That's right. That's right. Don't forget to vote. Thank you for that, Randy. Thank you, Randy. Anybody else?
Is there a motion? Motion adjourn. Second. Okay. Motion second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. We stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night.